Many people met Jesus, and as a result, their lives has been changed completely. And today, in our series of meeting with Jesus, we read of this person Matthew, and how he met Jesus. And uh, <coughs> so, what we are going to do today, <coughs> sorry, through our Bible reading is to consider, firstly, at the meeting of Jesus, at the meeting of、uh, Matthew with Jesus, Jesus gave him an invitation, and then secondly, not only this invitation has make such a big change in his life and his direction of,、uh, and、uh, and he in turn extend an invitation to his friends. And then, thirdly,、uh, we are going to look at some of the reactions and criticism drawn as a result of the invitation of people to his home. And then, fourthly, we are going to look at Jesus' respond and his open invitation to anyone who cares to seek him. So, who is Matthew? <coughs> Now, in our scripture reading in Luke, we read, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi, sitting at his tax booth. Now, this person, Levi, is the same as Matthew, as recorded in the parallel passage in Matthew chapter nine. And if you look at another passage in Mark two. It speaks of the same event. It's the same person who has been known as Levi to some, and also Matthew to others. Now that's not uncommon, and、uh, for us coming from overseas, we probably have a Chinese name and also a, a English name with, Chi- with a Chinese name translated in English. So my name Wang Tai is an English name, but then many of us take on a different name like Peter, David, on top of their given Chinese name. So therefore,、um, Matthew has two names, and it, it is the same person. Now, what is his profession? He's a tax collector, and、uh, simply means someone collects taxes from the people in the society. Now, why did Jesus invite Matthew to follow him? Because we read in verse twenty-two, twenty-seven, Jesus said to him, "Follow him." And Matthew got up, left everything, and followed Jesus. Now, there's no reason given in our narrative or in the parallel passage in Matthew or Luke, uh, uh, in, or. This is Luke、uh, in Mark, and、uh, I wonder what did Jesus see in Matthew to extend his invitation. Again, the Scripture did not offer any detail either, but one thing we can be certain of is Jesus see in him, Matthew, that、uh, it is something that attracts Jesus, and he wants. Matthew to be one of his followers. Now, would you respond to Jesus' invitation if you were in his situation? Look, in this simple invitation, follow me. There is no promise of any financial gain or personal glory. You just simply say, "Follow me as one of my followers." Now Matthew, at this at that point in time, enjoys a good life because of his career as a tax collector. In verse twenty nine, we read he has a big house, a house big enough to entertain a large number of people. He probably had servants or slaves to serve his family, because. That's where he hosts a big banquet for his friends. So 
at that point in time, to follow Jesus would mean to give up a comfortable lifestyle and to face an almost uncertain future. But we read, he has no hesitation to follow Jesus. In verse 28, we read the three verbs to describe his action. He got up, he left everything, all the things that he was doing, maybe some of the money and account and whatever, and followed Jesus. Now, so for Matthew, following Jesus means more than just making a decision. Yes, I have decided in my mind to take you seriously. When I have a bit of time, I'll come to listen to you. No. He translates his determination to follow Jesus by instant action. Drop everything off and follow Jesus. Now sometimes our action to follow Jesus or our action may take us beyond our personal familiar environment and take us out of our comfort zone. Now for Matthew, to follow Jesus is worth it because we don't know how much he knows of Jesus at that point and we know that he's stuck with Jesus and it's most rewarding because he is following the Son of God, the light, the light of life. So for him to place his life in Jesus' hand and to follow him is in the safest place. There's nothing safest than being in the presence of the Son of God. So he's happy to leave his career and follow Jesus. And he was so excited about it, he wants to tell his friends. And uh, how did he share his experience of Jesus with his friends? In verse 29, he held a great banquet for Jesus at his house. And a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. So he decided to throw a big banquet in the honor of in honor of Jesus, VIP. Now obviously there's good reason for him to celebrate. Maybe he likes to know Jesus more. Maybe he's showing the gratitude to Jesus by throwing a big meal. We do that, don't we? Sometimes we invite friends to our house or to a restaurant because we value their friendship and uh, we like their company. But Matthew invites his friends to meet Jesus over this banquet. Not only Jesus and his disciples as well. And they are mixing together with his friends, which are naturally fellow tax collectors. We often have friends of the same occupation, isn't it? And uh, now, when we meet up with friends or colleagues, we call it networking, don't we? And uh, we like to do so because it is advantageous to us to have networking with the right kind of people, hopefully that will bring us success. In our networking, we socialize, we exchange information, we share experiences, and perhaps it can help us to focus or change our goals. Now, Matthew is not having that kind of networking banquet because he wants them to come to know Jesus. And uh, so he's happy to open his home and to throw a big banquet and share his experience with his friends. Now, personal sharing and showing hospitality are very effective ways of introducing Jesus to friends. We often thought evangelism 
is to invite friends to attend a church event in which the pastor or a special speaker will give a message and that usually takes place on a special day in a special place or in church but it need not to be the only way now do you realize your home can be a place where your friends can come to meet Jesus as their personal savior Matthew did that this is his desire for his friends to come and meet Jesus now, I wasn't a Christian when I went to England for my higher education. I lived on my own and didn't have many friends. But over Christmas holiday, I was invited by a Christian family to spend a day with them at their home. And that's the place where I experienced what hospitality and Christian love in reality. Now, the this experience did not happen to me alone because I was told of a similar story recently. This young person came from overseas to study in Australia. Like me, he didn't have many friends. Like me, he was struggling to converse in English comfortably. Yes, we study and use English in school in Hong Kong, but to be able to, 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 to speak fluently takes some courage. And he hasn't got the self-confidence or the courage to do so. But then some elderly Australian ladies showed him kindness and invited him home where he can talk and communicate and improve and improve his English. And as a result, he said he noticed what Jesus and Christianity means in reality through the lives and the interaction and the hospitality of these few elderly Australian ladies. That is how he came to know the Lord in his student days and he's still a fine Christian today. So hospitality and personal sharing is a very effective way to introduce Jesus to friends. Are you prepared to use a home to show hospitality? You need not organize a big banquet like Matthew. You don't need to preach well because Matthew at that time wasn't trained yet. He just simply followed Jesus. So I would imagine when he is sharing with his fellow tax collectors, he just simply say, look, this is how I found this Jesus in my life. And, uh, <clears throat> and this is how he extends his invitation to me. And it means so much that I'm willing to drop my career, to leave everything and follow him. Now, <clears throat> Matthew was happy to do that, open his pocket, and to throw a big dinner so that his friends can meet Jesus face to face. But not many people were happy about it. Who are these people and what did they do? Now his hospitality drew criticism <coughs> and it is in verse 30 we read, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belong to their sect complained to his disciples, that's to Jesus' disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Now notice, the criticism was directed at Jesus. And uh, they are complaining this to his disciples. So what is their criticism? Simply means Jesus should not be eating with this lot, tax collectors and sinners. And that's what they are in their eyes. Now, perhaps this criticism would not mean much in our 21st century mind. Can't I eat with whom I like? Surely I have the freedom to invite people home, especially this is a private function. But in their criticism, 
that this religious group, Pharisees and the teachers of the law, implied that if Jesus is worthy of our attention, then he would not have associated himself with such characters, tax collectors and sinners. Now, firstly, who are the Pharisees? Well, they are an ultimate religious group in, in the days of Jesus. And uh, they are so determined not to break any of God's law. So they devise over time an extensive system of oral tradition to keep them from breaking the law of God. So, in short, they reduce the God's word into a set of code of practice, do's and don'ts. Now, they're not the only people, even today, there are many people who have this misconception. When I became Christian, my friend told me, Ah, you can't do this now. There are a lot of, you must do this because you are a Christian. You mustn't do this. You cannot do this. Now, for the Pharisees, in order to keep the Sabbath holy, which is clearly written in the Ten Commandments, so they work it out. Well, how do we keep the Sabbath holy? It's not just a day of rest physically. It's not just a day where you can direct your attention and worship God. You mustn't do any work so that you can keep the Sabbath holy. Now, so what is work? Is cooking work? Now, on one occasion, when Jesus and his disciples walked past a field, and uh, the disciples were hungry, and uh, like what most people, you perhaps and me included, would have done the same thing. As they walked by, they pluck the head of grains, they rub it on their hand, and they just simply put them in their mouth. Now, it is quite all right for the Jews to do that. However, they cannot do that on the Sabbath. But for them, plucking means harvesting. Rubbing the head of grain to get rid of the, uh, the, the, the outer layer, there is grinding. And for them, this work violates the Sabbath law of no working. You see the point? And on one occasion, when Jesus restored the sight of a blind man on the Sabbath day, and what did the Pharisees say? It was recorded in the, in the Gospel. They said, this man, Jesus, is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. So on this occasion, you can almost see the face and the pointing finger of the Pharisees. This Jesus cannot be from God. He is not worthy to be listened to because he is not keeping away from these people, tax collectors and sinners. See the arrogance of these Pharisees and the religious teachers. Now, so what is so bad about being a tax collector? Well, not many people like to pay tax in the past, in the present, and also in the future. Tax collectors are never popular in any society. In the days of Jesus, tax collectors were seen as social outcasts. They are to be rejected. They can't even attend a religious meeting in a synagogue. What do they do under the Roman time? Well, the Roman government has a way to collect taxes. What they do is they would decide the amount of tax to be collected 
in the district. Say, for example, they will look at the population and the trade and the living standard in Glen Haven. And they decided, just for this sake of illustration, the tax to be collected is one million. How do they go about it? Then they will sell the right to the highest bidder. So as long as you put up the bid and say, look, I will promise to get one million for the government for this year, then I'm willing to be the tax collector. So <clears throat> as far as the collectors are concerned, anything that they manage to get over and above the one million will be theirs. They're entitled to, to retain whatever else they could extract from the people. And the ordinary people had no idea how much they should pay. So therefore, in the eyes of the Jews, the tax collectors are not only traitors working for the Roman authorities to suppress and bleed us to death. Now, what kind of taxes do they have to pay? It's interesting, just to share that. The first one is poll tax. In other words, any man aged 14 and above below 65 has to pay tax. Any woman from age 12 to 65, again, you have to pay tax regardless of your income. You have to pay for the privilege of existing. That's what it means. Secondly, there is a ground tax. In other words, you pay 10% of all your grain harvest and 20% of all the wine and oil products. On top of that, you pay income tax. Now that's the tax to the states. And what about other duties? Like our present system, we have to pay uh, toll road in certain places. If you get into uh, certain roads, you have to pay. Same there. On some main roads, harbour, big markets, you have to pay at the entrance. If you are carrying any goods with you, you pay more. If you carry a cart on the wheel, whether it is pushed by yourself or pulled along by animal, you have to pay. On top of that, they have GST. GST is not a recent invention. You pay purchase tax on certain articles, imports and imports. And you can understand why tax collectors are not popular. And, uh, and if a man or if a person could not pay the tax, the tax collector will enter a deal and say, look, I'll lend you money so that you can pay the tax. However, you have to pay me back at a certain interest, certain rate of interest. So the poor will get further and further into their debts and into the hands of the tax collectors. And that's why the tax collectors were classified together as robbers. They robbed our money. They are murderers. They take away what is precious to us. The sinners. Now, for the Pharisees, they would not even let their robe touch the likes of Matthew and these tax collectors if they walk along on the road. Such is their spiritual arrogance. These tax collectors are robbers, murderers, sinners. Have you met such people who has such a religious arrogance in them? Perhaps we have met people who are so proud of their own achievements. And when you are with them, you feel you're so small and so insignificant and to be so unworthy to be in their presence. Now, would Jesus make tax collectors feel the same? Surprise! No! He welcomed them. 
And what did Jesus reply to the criticism of the Pharisees? He said in verse 31, It is not the healthy who needs a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now in verse 31, you might say, what kind of reply is it? He just simply state a fact. Yes, it is only the sick who needs to get help from a doctor. I think behind this statement, Jesus is inviting the listener to ask for themselves, do you really know your real condition? Are you sick? Are you healthy? Recently, when I asked my doctor for a referral, my doctor said, Hey, I haven't seen you for a while. Has been a while since you had your blood test. Would you like to make an appointment? I'll give you a checkup. Now, I thank God for such a thorough, good doctor. Give me a good physical checkup and send me for a full blood test, which has revealed there is some concerns. Now, Jesus is such a doctor. He said, look, I'm only useful if you realize that you are in need of a doctor. And if you're ill, if you're sick, Jesus said, look, I'm happy to make myself available to you. You know, sometimes doctor will just see you and then try to sort of push you away by giving you some quick prescriptions. I've been told in some occasions, they just give you some vitamins and then send you off. But Jesus is a good doctor. He listens. He spends time with you. He gives you a good, thorough checkup. And he helps you to recover. Now, in his public ministry, for those who came to him, some of them have different, uh, different needs. Some were not able to walk. They had to be carried by friends. When Jesus healed them, the lame was able to walk. They were able to pick up the mat on which they came with and walk freely on their own two feet. What were the blind? Jesus restored their sight and gave them the life back. What about some incurable diseases? In those days, leprosy was incurable. And it's pretty sad if anyone is declared to have leprosy because it is a complete cutoff from the society. They can't even live in the same village. They have to live outside. And if anyone who likes to help them, to give them food, they have to leave them outside where they live. And then when they've gone, then those with leprosy will come out and collect the food for themselves. No work, no income, and no contact whatsoever. We know what's like under the COVID restriction, isn't it? I know a friend who told me, he said, look, if I have to stay within this four wall any longer, I'm going mad. Now, Jesus healed them. And uh, so Jesus said, it is not the healthy who needs a doctor, but the sick. When do you last see a doctor? Perhaps you say, I don't need to see a doctor because I'm well. In that case, good. Thank God for that. But however, however sometimes we might not realize that we are sick. And that's the sad part of it. There are some people who think that they are well, but internally, inwardly, they are not well. Now, I know someone who said to me, look, you look at me, I look normal, I laugh, I attend meetings, and I carried a normal life. However, I suffer depression. 
chronically. I remember one girl, one girl、uh, at the Bible College. She was a doctor herself, and she was a very pleasant and a friendly person. But one day, she looked a different person altogether, and she just said, "Look, I'm sorry. I need medication to control my depression." So there's nothing wrong to receive medication to help our physical condition, but what is sad is that not to seek help. And Jesus is saying, "Look, if you think that you are healthy and you don't need me, then it is most sad that you don't really、uh, realize." There is a cure. There is a person, and because of your spiritual arrogance, the Pharisees refused to come to Jesus. And Jesus said, "Look, I have come for not for the righteous, but sinners to repent." Now, what does Jesus mean? I have come to call the righteous. Sorry, I have come. Sorry, I have not come to call the righteous. Does that mean Jesus do not accept the good, upright, righteous person? Does it mean that if you live a moral life, then God is happy to let you on your own and、uh, let you get on with your life and、uh, and then and said, look, I have no dealing with you because you are so good. If you live a good moral life, upright life, then it's good, because God is pleased to see men and women live a good upright life because He's a good and holy God. But in reality, can anybody claim to live a life free of sin? Can anyone claim to be right, and I can stand up before God's? Close examination, but what Jesus means is, I come for the sinners. If you think that you are righteous, if you think that you are too good for good for God, then your arrogance has turned you blind to your real sickness. Your arrogance has stopped you from seeking help. But Jesus said, "I will have time for anyone, even the sinners, even the social outcast, even the tax collectors." Now, on one occasion, Jesus made this point, and、uh, in Luke chapter eighteen, he used this parable to highlight this point. He said there are two people who went to the temple to pray. One is a Pharisee, this religious, pious guy, and when he stood in front of God, he was praying and give thanks to God. He said, "God, I give you thanks because I am not like that person who rob, who steal, who commit adultery, like, or even like that tax collector." He was pointing to the guy far away. That guy who is not worthy to be standing next to him. The Pharisee,、uh, the tax collector, on the contrary, he stood before God, and he couldn't even raise his eye up in to heaven when he prayed. All he said was, "God, be merciful to me, for I'm a sinner." Now, as compared to the Pharisee, he said, "Look, God, not only that I did not steal, I did not rob, I did not commit adultery, I did not behave like that tax collector. I follow your word closely to the letter. I even do more than that. I fast twice a week. There's no regulations in the Ten Commandments or in God's word." To compel anyone to pray and fast, they do so when they feel that it is a serious matter and they need to seek God's face. 
And these Pharisees said, look, even you did not ask for it, I'm happy to do so twice a week. And not only I am a law-abiding person, I pay tax to that tax collector, I even pay offering. One-tenth of my income I gladly bring to you. Uh, is he not a good person? Jesus said, Do you know, when these two people left the temple, who is the one who receives mercy from God? Not the righteous Pharisee. Not the law-abiding person who thinks that he is so upright. He's righteous. But the unrighteous, the sinner, because he knows that he is wrong. And he asks God for help. He acknowledged that he is a sinner. And he asks for mercy. And that's why in the parallel passage in Matthew 9, on the same account, and uh, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who needs a doctor, but those who are ill. And he said, go and learn what it means. He's referring to the scripture. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Now that is God who says to his people, look, I show mercy. And I am pleased when people come to me to repent and ask for forgiveness. God cannot be bright. We cannot come to God and say, God, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do even more when you bless me. No, no, no. God is looking for people who wants to be right with him. Are you sick? Do you in need of help? Well, maybe some of us need help, need to be healed physically. Yes, that's why we pray for one another. We know that God is a gracious God. And He's able, if He so will, to bless us with good health, health and to help us to recover. And grant us the ability to recover, sometimes through medicines and sometimes without medicine. God is able to do that. Jesus did. But God is also willing to heal us emotionally. Now, nowadays, we can seek psychologists, psychiatrists, when we cannot get our mind round, or when we feel depressed, when we feel that it is more than just a physical, maybe psychological, maybe something deep in, deep within. Now, thank God that there are specialists in the medical field who can help us accordingly. And God is saying, look, not only I can touch your life and fix what is not fixed and heal what is hidden, I can also help you not only emotionally, not only physically, but spiritually. I think that is the important part, isn't it? For the Pharisees, the tax collectors, the sinners are to be rejected at all costs. But Jesus said, look, I'm coming, and my purpose of coming is for sick, is for those who know that they are sinners. They will not be rejected by Jesus. They would be welcome. Now, in this passage, Matthew met Jesus, and as a result of his response to follow Jesus, his life turned completely. We knew from the scripture that he was one of the twelve apostles. In Acts chapter 1, after Jesus' ascension, he was one of those twelve who took the commission of Jesus and go and preach the good news of Jesus to all nations. So, obviously, he has changed his career. 
Now, God may not need us to change our career, but God is also looking for people who are serious with Him. Jesus is looking for followers, not just people who come and share a meal. Now, over that banquet, there's some people who might just turn around and say, thank you, Matthew, for inviting me. Oh, that guy, Jesus, was quite a guy. Yes, he's quite learned. I'm quite impressed. But perhaps, you know, we'll, we'll meet up again next and then forget about it. There are many people who have such encounters with Jesus. But as a result, there's little difference in their life. But then there are some, like Matthew, who took up Jesus' invitation seriously. Now, Jesus actually made many invitations. And uh, some responded to him in a positive way, like Matthew, and become disciples. Some heard it, ignored it, and walked away. Do you know who was the last person that received Jesus' invitation? Well, <clears throat> when Jesus was on the cross, he was dying. And next to him, there were two criminals, and they were also dying. One guy said to Jesus, Look, if you were the Son of God, then why are you hanging up there? You are just like us, being punished and suffering on the cross. We are dying. And this is the last breath. If you were the Son of God, come down, then I would believe you. Now, he was obviously teasing rather than seriously doing so. Because the other guy, the other criminal, who was also dying, getting his last breath, told him off and said, Look, you and I suffer what we deserved. We're sinners, we're criminals. However, this guy, Jesus, didn't do anything wrong. Now, we don't know how much this other guy know of Jesus. There's no, uh, no details given in the scripture. Perhaps he has heard of Jesus through his friends. Maybe he heard Jesus preaching from a distance. Maybe he just was told of Jesus by his friends when he was dying or on the way to death. We, but that's not the point. The point is he recognized Jesus in his plea. He said, Jesus, remember me when you come into the kingdom. What? He was dying on the cross and to the eye of the others, Jesus is going to die. And also the, the other criminals said, look, you cannot be the Son of God. But he has the eye of faith. So look, when you come into your kingdom, he knows that Jesus is not going to end as a dead person. He is going to inherit the kingdom of God. He's the king. He will bring the kingdom forward. So he said, look, when you come into your kingdom, Please remember me. Remember the criminal, the dying person, the sinner next to you. Now, Jesus gave him this lovely invitation. So today, and a, prop, and a promise as well. So to, today, you and I are, just going to, and are going to die. But I promise you, you will be with me in paradise. We don't end up on the cross. Our body might be taken down and buried, but you and I will go to a place that is beyond this world, and it is in the presence of God in paradise. So today, I think Jesus has this question for us as well. Are you right with God? Are you well? Now, for Christians, perhaps we thought, well, I'm a Christian. I have been a Christian for so many years. 
But I think the same question applies. Do you realize you are in need of healing? There are some foreign things within us that needs to be taken away, like cancer. If it's not going, it's not. If it's not dealt with, it's going to drag us down. The Pharisees, they have arrogance. They have the spiritual achievements in their eyes. Look, they are righteous. They fast twice a week. They did not steal. They did not kill. They did not rob. Unlike these, you know, useless. You know, scum. I'm good. I'm fine. Unfortunately, they did not realize that they are the one who needs help, and it's sad that they do not recognize it, and as a result, they did not seek help. Now, for Christians, I think that is a continuous process. We might come to know the Lord, and uh, we were we were baptized, and we attend church, but sometimes. I, f I feel that Jesus is asking us: Has He got any need in our life? Do we still need Jesus? Are we saying, "I'm fine, I'm fine, I'll be okay. Just let me get on with my life"? No, I'm not all right with God. That's why I need Jesus every day. Do you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that through your word, you have given us your calling. Lord, we give you thanks that you give up, uh, give out invitation to Matthew and anyone who feels they have a need for your healing. Lord, we come to you and ask for nothing but your mercy. Lord, we acknowledge that sometimes we are too proud to come to you, and sometimes we are too blind to see our own fault. Lord, we acknowledge before you that we are helpless, we are sinful, and we need a doctor. Lord, we ask you therefore to come into our lives, to take away the thing that shouldn't be there, take away the things that that is killing us. The thing that is stopping us from enjoying a good relationship with you, Lord, heal us spiritually, and be merciful to us. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.